Welcome, everybody. So, um, thank you for coming along to tonight's meeting. I believe you've got some people joining us. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Um, there's a few things I need to, to read out before we start. Well, there's no fire alarm planned for this evening. Should the alarm sound, please leave by the nearest available emergency exit. That's generally going to be that one there or the side one over there. Two of the closest exits through the glass door, which I'll just point out to you, and behind my um, number behind me, but I think with this number of people, we go that way or that way. Um, so closest exits exit's enough. The glass door's behind them left and through the double doors onto the riverside behind you. Okay, so that's the and meet at the Cafe des Amis, which is the uh, cafe on the corner. Members of the public are welcome to make their own recordings of the meeting using whatever non-disruptive methods they think are suitable. This meeting is being minuted, recorded and audio live streamed by the Council's website. The Westgate Gardens gates on the riverside are locked at sunset, so members of the public must leave the Guildhall by the side exit behind the glass door. So, welcome to this meeting of the Cabinet. The Cabinet is part of the Council responsible for most day-to-day -day decisions. It's made up of the Leader, who is elected by the Council, and that's myself, Alan Baldock. The other cabinet members are Councillor Dixie, who's deputy leader, and cabinet member for property, performance and oversight. Councillor Sol is the cabinet member for finance. Councillor Hazelton, the cabinet member for housing. Councillor Dawkins, cabinet member for climate change and biodiversity. Councillor Charlotte Cornell, cabinet member for heritage, open space, waste and recycling. Councillor Chris Cornell is a cabinet member for the coastal towns. And Councillor Ricketts is a cabinet member for tourism, movement and rural development. And Councillor Nolan, in the community, culture, safety and engagement. The cabinet collectively provides strategic leadership to the council. Pippa, any apologies tonight? No. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next is the declarations of interest for any members or officers. Okay, none, none uh, declared now. Obviously, you can declare anything later if you wish to. Announcements. Um, any cabinet member wish to make an announcement in, in, in the meeting? Are you all happy on that? Okay, thank you for that. Um, do we have any public participation? Okay. First thing we're going to do then is to uh, um, hopefully agree the minutes of the last meeting, which we held on the 4th of December 2023. Um, so if you're okay to agree those uh, minutes, which you've all seen as a true record, then um, I need a second, please. Okay, Councillor Dixie, thank you. And we need to agree those by general assent, if we're, we're happy with that, are we? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, we're now down to item uh, six, which is the uh, references from the committees, in, in, which is in, in the supplement to these notes. Um, and we're going to note the minutes of the overview and scrutiny meeting on 25th of January 2024, and they're in the supplement. Um, I don't know whether any cabinet members want to make comment on, on that. It was certainly quite an impressive meeting that was very useful and thoughtful to us all, I think, and several of us were there. Um, does anyone want to make a comment at all about that at all? I, I will probably make reference to it in the um, some of the, the, the items later on, because obviously both the uh, the Love Project and the OSPO were discussed heavily there. So. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. And thanks to that committee for some excellent work there and, and really helpful to help us in our decision making. And uh, whatever people say, it definitely is. It's good to have those criticism and some uh, some wise advice too. Thank you. If we're happy, then we, we note that item six by general assent. I, I gather we're okay with that. Thank you for that as well. Um, then we move to item part A of our agenda. Um, these are the items that can be considered with public participation, which unfortunately we don't have any, but, um, and I've worked through them fairly slowly and fairly carefully, each one, one at a time. They cover quite a wide variety of things. So we, we deal with each one um, uh, in turn. The first one, item seven, is the East Kent Services Transition Business Case. Um, I'd like us tonight to consider the report which we've all seen, um, which was uh, written by Tricia Marshall, Head of Corporate Services. Um, uh, the officer 
uh, representing here is Nikki Mills, the Service Director for Finance and Procurement, and I'm going to be the Cabinet Member for uh, the lead on that particular thing. So um, I'm not going to make a huge amount of uh, play on this particular item. I think we've, I, I gather everyone has obviously read the, uh, the report that was before us. And at this moment in time, um, we have to understand that that decision is a, is a joint decision between three councils. Um, and that decision to, to move forward um, with a LATCO to look after what was the services carried out by Civica, Civica when they um, uh, leave, leave their uh, current role at the end of the year, early next. So with that in mind, um, we've decided, I suppose, as a group of three councils to move towards a LATCO as the most likely scenario for going forward and running that service between us. Um, at this moment in time, what we're endorsing here is for uh, a proper, in-depth and detailed report to go before us uh, to, re to, be, to help the decision to be made properly. And that's what we're, we're liking uh, to move forward with that tonight. So I would ask um, Tricia Marshall if she's got anything to add to that. I think there are some things that from the officer's point of view, because it's equally important for them on this particular one. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, this is a, a proposal um, that would keep the shared services together, as, as, um, as the Chair said. Um, this is a, a process and a decision that's being driven by Civica deciding to pull out of delivering these services. Um, it's been a shared service, I think, since about 2010, 2011, um, and has consistently provided a high level of performance to all three councils. Um, the proposal is that you would agree um, that a joint LATCO is your preferred option, and then that, that would be taken through by the East Kent Services Committee, which has um, membership made up of the leader and deputy leader from the three councils of Canterbury, Dover and Thanet. As, uh, as the Chair has said, um, that's, you're voting on that as the preferred option, um, and we need to work through a level of detail at the East Kent Services Committee meeting. There were a number of questions and issues raised by um, the councillors from the three authorities who were generally, I think, in accordance in the questions they were asking. They were all coming from the same sort of place, but they're, they're wanting to understand it more and have more detailed report coming back to that committee. So that will be the next step if you approve this tonight. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. That's some um, good summary. I think we've, we've um, obviously talked about this. I believe um, the uh, between ourselves and uh, said, well, but it is important, I think, that we understand that this is a, us giving the go-ahead for a report. It's not the decision that's time. That can that is in some time uh, in the future. So, any comments, any thoughts, any issues that the cabinet would like to bring up and, and get out in the open? Really, I think it's an important thing. Big change. Thank you, Councillor Sol. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, we obviously have no choice but to put something in place to um, replace the operation that Civica do, and it, it does seem that a LATCO is the best option so far. Although I do take your point that we've got extra work to do on that. Um, I think all of us have got some questions about the logistics of it, and particularly how we work with two other authorities um, to make sure that it works for for everyone. Um, but on the basis that at the moment we're just looking to for a, a bigger report to get more information, I'm quite happy to to proceed on that basis. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely right. Has anybody other got some important questions? I'll we'll sum up a little bit in a minute, so we've got to know exactly what we're voting on. Yeah, go ahead, Connie. I think it's no secret that um, I'm not very happy with the concept of LATCOs anyway. 
Um, I know that shared, shared services was, was a, an idea in the 1990s to early 2000. And at the time, it did seem a really good idea to share costs in, in shared, you know, literally shared services. But I am quite concerned, and I'd like, um, if possible, Tricia, to have a look at some kind of break clause. So if it all goes wrong, how do we get out of it? Um, and I, I, I think in any contract that you have, in, in any business environment, you should think very carefully about who you get into partnership with. Um, and not only should you think carefully about who you get into partnership with, but how do you get out of partnership? So if that, that could be considered, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, that's a point we can know. Um, yeah, any other points at all? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm looking for the supplement which I haven't got in front of me. So um what we're gonna be voting on, um Pip's gonna read read out. Um so there's no confusion at all. And uh Again, if you want questions at that point, then please do. Okay, this is to recommend to Council A, to exit from the contract with Civica UK Limited for the delivery of revenue, benefits and customer services. B, to approve the LATCO service delivery vehicle as a preferred option for future service delivery. C, to approve the business case for the LATCO pursuant to Article 2 bracket 2 bracket B bracket of the local government bracket best value authorities bracket bracket power to trade England order 2009 D <laughs> to, to the extent that it is not otherwise author, authorised to do so to authorise the East Kent Services Committee to exercise the powers and functions of the council to form the LATCO and to enter into the contract with it to include but not limited to making decisions on behalf of the council in relation to point nine of the report. Thank you for that and just before we do vote I want to make a public assurance to you all in cabinet and to this council that the final decision would obviously rest with East Kent Services Committee, which is myself and, and Councillor Dixie, sit on your behalf. But I don't think either of us are in the process of not sharing what is before us that we would be potentially agreeing on your behalf. Um, and we would make that decision guided by the report and guided by our discussions with you and any input from other people, officers and councillors as well. So the decision will be ours to make, that's true, but I won't be making that in isolation and that's my public assurance to you that I will be seeking your opinions on that as well. Um, and Councillor Dix is nodding in agreement to that as well. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, uh, did we get a second? Did we get a second? Did we get a second? I could ask for somebody to second that, please, and then we vote. Thank you, Councillor Dixie. So, um, do we need a proper vote? Yeah, if everybody's obviously in agreement, we can do a show of hands. Um, is is anybody uh, happy with a show of hands on this particular vote? Okay, should we do that in place? That'd be really good. Thank you. That was unanimous, wasn't it? Thank you. This is the, the second act, and this is where two other people take over the rest of the meeting, almost, actually. Um, <laughs> and the first on stage so <laughs> tonight, um, when we start to work our way through the budget papers, <clears throat> is going to be uh, uh, Councillor Mike Soul. So this time it's, it's item eight, which is um, we're going to be thinking now and, and, and um, working forward and, and recommending to full council if we all agree. Non-domestic rates, business rates, discretionary relief policy as pages 16 to 134 in our agenda. So we're going to consider this report, which is from Nikki Mills, Service Director of Finance and Procurement. So um, thank you, Nikki, for that report. And um, uh, Cabinet Member Sibby Hoyes, Mike Sol, and he's Cabinet Member for Finance. And we thank, um, and I thank uh, Mike to, uh, 
to say a few words to introduce before we start to debate in more fully. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, 16 to 134, a lot of, lot of pages there. Uh, a lot of a lot of information a lot of work's gone gone into this um so to help everybody i'd just like to s provide a brief summary of, of what it's all about um these changes proposed are in essence just a housekeeping exercise the existing policy contains irrelevant references to council tax and is split into two separate documents one from 2016 and one from 2018 which included new reliefs introduced in 2017. The policy and the information contained within it needs tidying up, whilst at the same time providing an opportunity to make the decision-making process clearer to applicants. Essentially, the proposals in the revised policy are aimed at, one, amalgamating the current 2016 and 2018 policies into one, two, removing all references to council tax discretionary relief as council tax relief is now contained in its own discrete policy from 2021. Three, setting the revised policy out in two volumes, volume one containing the reliefs mandated by central government and volume two containing the reliefs over which the district has authority. The volume two reliefs we refer to as true discretionary reliefs and is focused and is the focus of this report. By setting out the revised policy in this way, it makes it far clearer to businesses which reliefs the district has discretion over. Four, Implementing a transparent scoring matrix under which all applications for true discretionary business rate relief will be considered and also having some type of business that will automatically receive true discretionary relief. And finally, the revised policy allows for consistent decision making and will, if approved, align with Dover and Thanet councils, both of whom have recently approved the revised policy. So um, all existing recipients of the true discretionary relief have been told that the policy is being revised and if the policy is approved they will need to reapply for the relief under the new policy and scoring methodology. Um, there are currently 147 recipients and 48 of those fall, in, fall into the automatic qualifiers category set out in the report appendix 5 volume 2 paragraph 4.6.2. Uh, the remainder will need to reapply under the new policy. However, we don't anticipate any change in the financial impact of reliefs awarded, but officers of Civica will monitor expenditure against the new policy on a monthly basis and report to this council section 151 officer as set out in section seven of the report. So I don't know if that's made it any clearer or more complicated, but as I started off by saying, it really is a tidying up exercise. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna be any worse off from this, um, but there will be a bit of um, reapplication by a few people. Uh, but that will be monitored to make sure they are doing that. Thanks, Mike. I appreciated that. And so it's a tidying up exercise that um, I think we can be pleased that we've had the uh, had the opportunity to, to do that. So that'd be fine. Um, Chris, come back, please. Yeah. Uh, I had the uh, joy last uh, Tuesday of uh, sitting in the top of my local bookshop with a whole variety of local businesses talking about uh, problems on the high street. And it's... Uh, uh, important to say that essentially uh, business rates are a problem, you know, particularly at the moment with the uh, tailing off of some of the COVID uh, uh, support. We've got a property in Whitstable High Street, which is uh, the tenants just given notice on, which has a rateable value of uh, 33K. So before you start the business, you're spending £1,500 or so on business rates. So um, this might be a tidying up exercise, but I think it's a timely one uh, because I think that Fundamentally, we need to give clarity to particularly charities and the voluntary sector and education providers and other people who might be able to breathe life back into our high streets about the ways in which they might be able to use retail premises for that. Um, and I hope that in having a uh, wider and more expansive corporate plan, which is focusing on some of those priorities, we can also help people um, identify some of the synergies with the work that we're doing in order to... Uh, remove some of those blocks from our high street and breathe new life into them. So uh, this strikes me as a really neat piece of work and far clearer for essentially people who are wondering, could I go into that space? What could I do with it? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, definitely getting that tabulated sort of likely uh, businesses that will get a business reef or not is, is a really helpful thing forward, isn't it? And I think taking too much discretion or taking the discretion away and making it more tabulated is definitely helpful. 
I'm sure it's going to make a big, big difference. So, any other comments from anybody? Um, Mel. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a, a little one, really. Um, yeah, obviously that's a, a big report, and thank you for doing, getting that all together and the changes. I'm just wondering. Um, that's quite a lot to go through. How what? I, just asking what support there is for businesses um, on a sort of one-to-one -one level. You know, to speak to someone when they're to make sure they're getting the right relief. Um, for their business and to help them through the process if they need to reapply. Thank Go you, ahead, um, <coughs> Yes, I think the, the quickest uh, way to get any support is through the portal uh, on the website that goes directly to the team, um, but they are anticipating um, working with businesses one-to-one -to, -one, um, to support them. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That's, that's that's good to hear. I mean, supporting businesses is one of our big priorities as this council was here straight away. So um, good to see that as well. Any other comments, anybody? Okay, I just tidy up what we're going to vote for. Do you want Thank me to you. propose it, Chair? <laughs> yeah, that, why not? That's a really good idea. You're, you're, and and seek somebody else to get a second, that'd be really good. Thank you. Um, yeah, in, in that case, uh, I will propose that A, we approve a revised business rates discretionary relief policy in two volumes, B, approve the automatic award of relief to certain business types, and C, approve a revised process for making decisions on relief applications in non-automatic award cases on a case-by-case -case basis via a scoring matrix procedure. Let me second in, please. be voting against that at all if not we can do it by by show hands so a show hands will be good thank you very much okay that's that's again unanimous thank you for that chance Okay, next item, item 9, uh, pages 135 to 145, and much shorter this time, you notice. And so, um, But this is, again, um, a piece of work that we, we must do, and it's an important piece of work that we do every year. And uh, this, the officers looking after this um, is uh, Patricia Marshall, Director of Corporate Services, and Head of Paid Services, and Charlie Greenaway, Head of HR. And they've prepared the report that we've, we've all seen. Um, the officer tonight to look after that is Trisha Marshall, Corporate Services Director. And again, the Cabinet Member in charge again is uh, Councillor Sol. Um, uh, if uh, Mike would like to introduce the uh, item now, which is a paid policy statement 2425, and then we can uh, have a, uh, a discussion if we wish to um, before we recommend to full Council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As you mentioned, this is an annual report. It's something we have to do. Um, the report lays it out very clearly what's in there. And I, I don't really have anything to, to add to that. So um, I would only propose, if I may, that the policy, the pay policy statement for 23-24 is adopted. Uh, could I have a second for that, please? Thank you, Councillor Dixie. Yep, and shall I have some? If, if there's no... Go ahead, uh, Mel. Yeah. Thank you. No, just a couple of questions, because I'm curious. Um, one was um, in the chief, of when it refers to chief officer, sir, there seems to be quite a lot of chiefs there. Um, I was just wondering why there were quite a lot of subtitles. And also, in item four, I was just interested to know if you can tell me, or maybe I need to go national government and ask, but um, why the lowest paid person employee is paid by the hour? And then as you go over 
a certain threshold you get paid per annum. So why why don't the lowest paid employers get the the annum rate rather than an hourly rate? Hey, can you pick up the official? If that makes sense, sense. Don't mind. Sure, I can explain more. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Um, sorry, Councillor, if you could just repeat that last bit again. Yeah, it was. I was just curious to know. So the lo the lowest paid person employer you, you, is it explains that they get twelve pounds an hour. But if you once you get past the lowest paid, then we all, it's all described in terms of their annual rate rather than hourly rate. So why do you have that difference? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's probably because a number of the staff who are paid at that rate, um, they're not actually working a fixed number of hours. They might be doing variable hours, so their salary will their pay will vary month to month depending on the hours work that they actually do. So that's that's why we probably quote it that way around. Do you want to come uh, to comment there? Uh... Well, I just wanted to highlight something because it came up in a meeting um, this afternoon um, that um, item three says that uh, the second paragraph, the council's pay policy includes the commitment to pay not less than the Living Wages Foundation's real living wage with effect from April each year. And I just wanted to highlight that because, um, as I say, it came up in a meeting, and I think sometimes people don't understand that the council is um, a responsible employer and um, has this commitment in their pay policy. Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor Nolan. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm, that I'm part of that council that does that as well, very much so. And uh, some <clears throat> lots of nodding heads here as well, so thank you for that. So, um, any other comments at all? Okay. We, we know what we're voting on, and if there's nobody going to be voting the other way, then we can do that on a show of hands again, if it's okay with you. Okay. Thank you. That's everybody again. You know. That's obviously a recommendation we're making to full council. So. Just making sure I've not jumped forward now. This is the uh, the second instalment, uh, well, third instalment really, Mike. So. Um, so this is item 10, the Council Tax 2425, to approve the Council Tax for the District, including the Kent County Council um, and the Fire and Rescue and the Kent Police and the Parish Council Precept. So it's all, all the Council Tax elements there, pages 146 to 153. So we're going to consider the report uh, from Tricia Marshall, Director of Corporate Services and Head of Paid Services, and Nikki Mill, Service Director of Finance and Procurement and Section 151 Officer. So the officer in charge of this particular item tonight is Nikki Mills, Service Director of Finance and Procurement and the 151 officer. And the cabinet member is uh, Councillor Mike Sol. Um, and I'll also invite uh, Mike to introduce the, the item for us and, as well, going forward, um, say some words. And then when he's happy, we can propose the, he'll propose the uh, item we're going to be voting on and seek a seconder for me. So um, I... Uh, I uh, ask uh, Councillor Sol to step in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. We, we are required to formally set our council tax. Um, of course, council tax is only a, a proportion of our total income that we spend, but this is the amount that residents pay us, and uh, our, the proposal is we increase our council tax by 2.99%, uh, which for a, a, a band D home is an increase of £6.97. And then the total council tax, of course, as, as you mentioned, um, the bulk of it is Kent County Council, but also uh, money to the Police and Crime Commissioner, the Kent and Medway Fire and Rescue Authority, and parish councils where applicable. So um, 
I would propose that we um, we ad we adopt this. Um, I won't need to formally do it, but this council approves a formal resolution set out in Appendix B to set the council tax for 24-25, and that if any of the precepting authorities change their precept figures before council on 22nd of February, the service director, finance and procurement will be authorised to present to council a revised resolution. That needs to be seconded, please. Thank you. Can I somebody second that, please? Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor Cornell. Thank you. That's Chris Cornell. Second. Okay. So we can ask any questions, any debate, um, any clarity um, before we, we we agree or otherwise that. Has anybody got anything to say? So, um, Councillor Chris Cornell. Uh, I, I appreciate that uh, most uh, laymen in the street, the council tax is just something that we uh, entirely pick up and hold on to. But I do find essentially every time that we set it, it is uh, useful and stunk to essentially see how your council tax gets split by, uh, by various different people. Uh, and we talk often about we only keep 11% of your council tax or so. But I, I think it is useful to note that essentially of all the council tax that you'll pay next year, £239.91 of it will essentially come to us. Uh, and I think that's important to essentially suggest when you look at what services you, uh, you, know, uh, you get uh, for it. I, I think talking about the specifics is useful. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, happy to proceed. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Councillor Dixie, please. Uh, can I just add to Chris's point, uh, 25 years ago or so, the split was very different. We got a much bigger share, uh, and the police, fire service, and the Kent County Council got a, a relatively lower share than they get now. So I think we can feel very hard done by by the way that the split goes. Yeah, indeed, it's, it's an incredibly tough picture, which will come more apparent as this budget conversation tonight comes forward, and all that we do for two hundred and odd quid a year. So. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. And it is quite a stark, stark reminder to us all, isn't it? Um, any other comments from anybody or thoughts? Okay. Uh, and of course, it's just worth noting, I think, uh, Councillor Sol, that we're increasing by the 2.99%, uh, 2, 2 which is the, the maximum we can um, increase by without having a referendum, isn't it? So it's, um, it's just a, uh, a very small increase. So, um, But the most we can do in that circumstance. So... Um, <clears throat> so it's been proposed and seconded. So um, if we're all happy with that, it's just a show of hands, please. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, that's no tea. That was unanimous. Thank you. stop us all thinking money and we'll start thinking other money <laughs> um item 11 now household waste and recycling centre lease um uh, pages 154 to 159 um we're going to consider a report by um bill hicks service director for place and richard hall uh, head of property and regeneration now this particular item there is an exempt appendices um and if we want to discuss anything in that appendices, which is to do with the uh, the cost of, of the um, transactions that we're dealing with and so on and so forth, then we will have to go into private session. Um, does anybody feel they need to talk about anything that is in that private section, section C? Okay, in that case, we're open to debate in a moment or two um, on the assumption that we can agree without going to private session to discuss details that are in the private session. So, um, so just to remind Sen that the uh, officer in looking after this tonight in our meeting is uh, Bill Hicks. 
and the cabinet member is uh, Councillor Dixie, who I'm going to ask to introduce the item uh, and obviously seek a seconder uh, and, and put forward the formal proposal, please. So Thank rather, you, Cap rather than talking money, we're talking rubbish. Um, the, the good news is that um, KCC are continuing on with um, the household waste recycling at Vauxhall Road. As I think we all know, with Kent's kind of council's difficulties, they were looking to close some, although I think those threats have all been withdrawn. And the only reason this is coming to, um, as, as it says on the report, is that the new rent will be over the threshold which, uh, which officers are, are, um, have authority to approve. Uh, these thresholds are being revised at Governance Committee in one week's time, is it, I think? Yeah. Uh, a, a substantial and slightly overdue, I think, re revision, both for leases and for disposals. And what else can I add to that? Um, the rent, actually, although it's on pink pages, is a, a very substantial increase, a very welcome substantial increase. So uh, I know this is very popular. Uh, Recycling Centre, uh, as somebody who uses it frequently, so I urge you to support this. Uh, would you? Would it be helpful if I read out the resolution? Yes, please, yeah. if you wouldn't mind, uh, Michael. Uh, can we resolve that the Head of Property, so property and Regeneration uh, is authorised to make any minor amendments necessary to the Heads of Agreement and to agree the final terms of the of the lease and then to authorize the head of legal services to enter into any legal documentation necessary to complete the lease. So move. Let me second that for us. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hazelton. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just a few comments now for tools. So I've got um, uh, Councillor Dawkins and then Councillor Chris Cornell. Uh, Mel, so. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Councillor Dixie, for um, presenting the report. I just have a couple of questions or comments, really. Um, yeah, very pleased that we're going to continue with the lease. That's great. Brilliant. I was just wondering, it's, it's the tenant's been holding over for quite a long time, so I was just wondering why it was... We were, It was since no, 2016, so why didn't we renew this lease earlier, especially since we're getting a, a lot better rent now um and also scooting through to the climate change impact assessment i noticed that there's no impact whatsoever i was just wondering well how you came what evidence you got for that impact because i seen uh, a lot of cars going in going into that um waste place and i was that to me that would have a bit of impact so i was just wondering where you got the evidence to say there was no impact and if this lawyer could go into, lawyer yeah. could go into it too. Yeah, um, yeah that's fine. If, if it's okay, can we deal with that? I, I think that first. I think that's the, um, as uh, Alex has said, there is no change on what's happening at the moment. So that's, I suspect, the reason. Can you add anything to that, Bill? Which is um, perhaps more anecdotal than factual, but with the appointments now that you have to make to go to the um, venue, um, the volume of traffic I, would, I, I, I know is, is significantly down on the previous time, so there's less queuing, uh, uh, which I think is um, a, a positive gain, but I can um, ask some questions and get some more detail specifically for you that, for, on that one, Councillor. And then the thank you. Then the question about the holding over since 2016. What was the reason for the wait? I don't. If I can respond to uh, the councillor again, there. Just to say, it does, it does say in the uh, report that the tenant was holding over since uh, 2016. So we will be due back rent through that period. So we haven't lost anything through the delay of it being finalised. Councillor Sol, please. Uh, I'm not sure if I should have declared an interest, but I am a Kent County Councillor, so I'll just mention that. And... Uh, ditto. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, any other points on that? Otherwise, I think we're reasonably happy to, to accept. I think so. Um, show hand we can do that by show of hands. I think if there's nobody would like to go. Okay, and again, unanimous. That's, that's good to get these things tied up as well, and good to get another lease under the some money coming in. Um, yeah, good one. So, okay, this is item 12, um, which is in part B of our agenda. So um, there's no public participation um, allowed in this part of the meeting because it's already been done um, in the other meetings. So um, mainly overview and scrutiny, but there was, uh, we've taken account of those comments anyway uh, in, in the reports and in our comments tonight, no doubt, and in our voting. So... Item 12 then, which is the Luff Highway project, um, that's the decision to implement. Um, again, uh, this is a report um, by, from Bill Hicks, Service Director for Place, and Richard Moore, Head of Transport and Environment. And the officer we're here to look after that for us tonight is Richard Moore, Head of Transport and Environment, and I'm sure can answer any, uh, answer any questions that we have. The Cabinet uh, Member is Councillor uh, Alex Ricketts, Cabinet Member for Tourism, Movement and Rural Development. Um, it's within Alex's uh, portfolio. So um, obviously we, uh, we're all fully aware that we should be thinking uh, about the OV and Scrutiny Committee and their comments and, and, and the way that they, uh, they felt about this particular proposal. So um, Alex, would you like to just introduce where we're gonna go with this and, and some comments and thoughts of yourself? Uh, and then we're we're open up um, to debate. So, just to make it smoother, if you could uh, introduce it, um, put forward the proposal, and seek a seconder, and then we're we're open up to debate. If that's okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair. What I, what I will do is actually I will read out the um, proposal first because there's actually quite a lot of the detail is in that. So it's probably easier if we do that. Then we know what we're talking about um, before we start talking, which is fairly rare. Um, so, I propose that we resolve that the detailed design shown in the drawings in Appendices 2 to 5 relating to the following projects, Westgate Square, St George's Square, St George's Lane, Dane John to Castle, via Castle Road Car Park, are agreed. That a Section 278 agreement is entered into with Kent County Council for the implementation of these projects. That the Cabinet Member for Tourism, Movement and Rural Development in consultation with the Head of the Transport and Environment, is given delegated authority to make any changes required by KCC. Do I have a second? There we go. Um, so, thank you, Councillor Sol. Uh, basically, I think we're, we're all fairly familiar with these, and this is, this is the, uh, the, the transport elements within the, the Luff project, which um, I think we, we need to get um, dealt with first and straight away. There was a wide-ranging debate at overview and scrutiny, which I've, I've since um, read and heard. And, and actually, with one of these in particular, there's already been quite a wide-ranging debate at the Joint Transportation Board, which uh, will we'll deal with a lot of these as they go through. I also want to mention, before I go on to what, what was said at overview and scrutiny, that there was a, um, a consultation carried out on these. And broadly, people were mostly in favour of these, these moves. Um, of the, I think it was 100 and... 30 odd responses, 140 odd responses to the consultation. The overwhelming impression was that people weren't happy with um, the way that these areas currently look and, and are keen for things to change. And when we get to the detailed proposals, that um, by far the, the most popular of them was the change to the pedestrian and cycle routes around the Norman Castle and the, the wider work that's gonna go on with the, um, the Luff project will we'll make that even better. Um, even with the, the ones that perhaps were the more controversial, which was the Pound Lane and St Peter's Lane issue, there was a, only a 40% disagreement with that. So I think that we can be confident that people are keen for things to happen in these areas. And then when we look at the detail of these proposals, that they want these, to, these changes to be made. But as was pointed out at overview and scrutiny, there is a degree of 
concern that these are carried out well. I think there's there's heightened um, attention going onto these kind of highways projects at the moment due to some of the issues with with some previous projects that were carried out. Um, and, and to mention that, I think that that one of the major concerns that people raised about these areas was danger to pedestrians from traffic. That's also one of the concerns they've raised about how these things are going to be implemented as well, that if we have some areas where there will be cyclists and, and pedestrians where cars are being removed from the area, they want to make sure that, that it is very clear where pedestrians can go and where cars can go. This is certainly something we've heard with Pound Lane. And I just want to assure everybody that with these resolutions tonight, this isn't a case of going, right, we've agreed it, that's what it looks like, we've got these drawings, that's it. These are going to be very, very closely monitored. I suspect they'll probably find their way back to back to this committee at some point. They'll certainly be in front of the Joint Transportation Board as anything happens. And, and where we're making this resolution for, for delegated authority to make any changes that KCC will agree, that is not a case of this is the last time you'll see this. These will be very carefully monitored. And obviously, with all of the other work that's going on with the Love Project as well, to make sure that these are implemented in a way that, that addresses those concerns raised by the public and overview and scrutiny. So I think I've waffled enough on that. Is there anything that anyone would like to mention on these? <laughs> yeah, I was, it's, that's good. So um, if I could be really cheeky, I, I, cause I was, was going to ask Charlotte whether she could just take a few views about more generally how these fit into the Luff project in general if you're happy with that so maybe if I take Mike first and then come to you is that okay yeah thanks yeah it, it was just a simple question um can can it be confirmed that Age UK are now happy with their um minibuses and other parking arrangements we certainly understand what they need and the the drawings set out their locations for their or minibus locations. Um, I think we, we still need to meet with them to make sure we've got it exactly right. But uh, the intention is that, uh, yeah, the provision that they've got now will still remain. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So the, um, the highways consultation fits into a pattern of other consultations to deliver the levelling up um, fund project. Um, this was one of the first public facing consultations uh, in, in the overall grand project because so many of the highways proposals require time and uh, to implement a, and multi agency agreement. I, I think we were really pleased with the level of engagement that we received and the consultation and, and data crunching I thought was excellent. Um, and I really appreciated how overview and scrutiny took note of that and also complimented the consultation exercise. I do have a few comments to make as it's not my report i'm sort of opposing them back to alex and or others um so the closure of pound lane the impact on car parking queues leaving the pound lane car park at peak time isn't something that can be ignored it does uh, have an environmental knock-on as, as well as frustrating um, people trying to leave the space it, to future plan for other ways we can alleviate some of those frustrations, very much the re, partial resurfacing and repainting of the directional lines and arrows within that car park would help, would help hugely. Equally, some um, planters or barriers, because what you have at the moment are people trying to exit from three or four or five different locations, and the squeeze to the barriers uh, only increases people's frustrations. I know, many people will know, um, that you can be stuck in Pound Lane car park at Marlow Theatre exit time for up to 30 minutes. And that's not an acceptable environmental outcome for the centre of Canterbury with everything we're trying to do. So I would really like us as a cabinet and uh, a, a, as a council to make sure that we bear future plans for that car park in mind. Equally, we should look at the impact of the Miller's Field co-timed exit on what's happening in Pound Lane, because these are all environmental consequences. As people pour out of Miller's Field, they're also coming out of Pound Lane. The crunch on the causeway is huge. People do not know that they can head down past the other car park and swivel through up past Northgate and out, because most people are visitors to town. This is compounded by the fact that the Luff walking routes are proposing putting perhaps an extra pedestrian crossing near St Radigan's car park, which will again slow down any traffic that might be wanting to take the Northgate exit out of town. So I do urge the 
consultative exercises to do with the Luff to make sure that they're talking to each other and we're not making the problem worse at Pound Lane. I highly support the closure of Pound Lane coming onto the Westgate Towers. Absolutely, it's the right thing to do. But our future planning for what we do with those two car parks, Miller's Field and Pound Lane, has to bear that congestion in mind because the environmental outcome is not satisfactory um, given these, these changes to the proposals. And actually, that should be, I think that should be noted in the environmental impact assessment. Um, the, uh, there should be a sign, I believe, on the Pound Lane car park which warns about the waits at peak times to exit and that other car parking options are available at X and Y. I think we can encourage people to get out of our ring road car parks that way and use the multi-storey at Station Road West, which offers a much more affordable option to park at peak times and allows you to escape at twice the speed should you be heading back to Whitstable or Hearn Bay. Um, on the bus station in St George's Lane, I'm really pleased to see that the report suggests there'll be a further short consultation on the bus shelter design. I think that's absolutely excellent and, ne and necessary. Um, please, could we include schools and not, we do include the Canterbury Academy Trust, but please could we also include the Dover Road and the new Dover Road and the old Dover Road schools, because most of those schools have one pickup at their school and later pickups all uh, co-terminus at the bus station. And I know that uh, for a lot of the students in the city, the bus station is an area of, well, refuge and concern in equal measure. And I know that a lot of people under the age of 18 and their parents will want to feed into the study. So please include those schools. I'd also like to see I've seen the list of people we consult with and it's excellent and I know we're always looking to add to that should we feel that opportunities to broaden opinion are there. Um, just with the way we include the safety of women and girls in our spaces, can we look to include the seroptimists in future um, consultative exercises? Obviously, they are a, a volunteer organisation. They've got a city branch. They specifically look at the impact of um, uh, choices and assessments in environment on women and girls. And I think with the bus station design, they should absolutely be involved in that consultation in addenda to all the other parties we usually consult with. On St George's Square, the cycle hub proposed to be located between the trees. We need to make sure if that does happen, that we protect the trees that are there from informally being used as cycle leans and damaged from continual brushing and impact. I also want to make sure that this uh, consultation exercise is talking to the Luff walking routes consultation exercise and exhausting whether or not Burgate Lane, which has a sort of two tier pathway, could be used for the cycle hub instead, removing the potential impact on some of the trees and getting an, a, an area by that roundabout used in a different way. I know it's I know it's been fed into the Luff walking routes uh, feedback, but I want to make sure that it, we don't uh, sign a deal here that prevents us making a better choice in a few months' time. With that in mind, um, oh, planters used as bins. We've already found on the high street that many of our new planters are being used as bins. And um, the Canon Co team and the Open Spaces team, we're looking at what we can do to remedy that. But I think the, the suggestion from overview and scrutiny about co-locating bins near planters wherever possible is, is definitely something that we should look at and is a good step that I would support. So any budget that's available for further bins near our future planned planters, I would be very grateful for as the Cabinet Member for Waste and Recycling. We will look, hopefully, as we roll out on-street recycling to make the, sure that those are on-street recycling options too. And indeed, if we're purchasing new bins, and we're also thinking about rolling out on-street recycling. Let's uh, make sure we're speaking to Canon Co and the waste team to see if some of those could be some of our first efforts in that regard. Um, finally, I'd like to, the resolution um, that Councillor Ricketts read at the beginning, uh, I, we delegate authority to Councillor Ricketts uh, and the team to make changes should KCC so request. I'd like to extend that so that changes could be made should other LUF consultation efforts recommendations or perhaps inter if we need to make changes not just if KCC require the changes but if our other consultations lead to slight highway changes for example on planters or cycle hubs we haven't tied our hands by making KCC the only authority that can make changes thank you <laughs> thank you for that okay we, we come back to the point that that um uh was made at the end there about the amendment we'll look at that separately in a minute or so just and uh 
Mel, Councillor Stilkins. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Charlotte, <laughs> for that. Um, was anyone writing that down? Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the KCC element as well, um, you know, just so we don't go down some of the routes that I've experienced um, in other parts of the city. But there has been quite a bit of talk about trying to have, you know, obviously when you hand over the section 278 to KCC, then, you know, it's kind of their own hands. But if we could have something in place, that's like a sort of gentleman's, well, you can't have a gentleman's agreement, but something in that sort of explains that Canterbury is this heritage city and we need to be sympathetic to that and when they're choosing their materials and the way that their workmanship goes on and all that sort of stuff. I know there was some talk with the cabinet member of highways at KCC that we might be looking to kind of draw up some sort of memorandum of understanding with heritage cities um, where, where we can where we, they take into account the uniqueness, if you like, and the history of a city when they're doing their work. So, yeah, if we can put something in place somehow before we hand over all of that responsibility in that section 278 um, and, you know, take on a bit what Charlotte's saying as well, just so we don't get into this situation where we wake <laughs> up in the morning of the next day and there's like some, like, yeah horrible garbage tarmac all over the place and you know how did we get there so we just need to safeguard a little bit and i think cautionary tale let's say and uh, let's learn from it i trust you, you you're not referring to the red tarmac are you mel but uh, did, did you want to comment on that about especially the sort of the understanding i think there's something in place but maybe we need to sort of make sure we move that a bit more the, the 278 process obviously enables us as effectively the developer to pay for works on on the highway it can be challenging particularly in historic environments where obviously the, we've approved these drawing hopefully approve these drawings showing materials such as granite sets which traditionally kcc don't want um, so we've got to reassure them that the materials that we're proposing are both fit for purpose um, and that the design is suitable for the loadings that will be required. If we can get over that hurdle, then hopefully we can get them on board. We won't be handing it over to them because clearly if, if we get at a bit of an impasse, um, we will have to have further talks at, uh, um, and potentially uh, uh, getting councillors involved to... To, to break through that impasse. We don't want to put you know, materials that aren't suitable in our you know, historic environment. And um, we'll, we, we won't, although this says minor changes will be delegated to us, but we're assured that um, both the uh, Alex and myself won't be signing off changes in materials that KCC um, might not necessarily want. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of um, Charlotte Cornell's points as well. Um, the, the Luff teams are talking to each other. So, yeah, the, 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 the walking route teams are talking to um, uh, my team who are delivering the, the, the bigger projects. Uh, I think the recommendation change is a really good one. I hadn't picked up on that, but you're right. It's not just changes that uh, might be required through the 278 process. Um, so I would support that recommendation change as well. Uh, and just on the, the St George's Street, this, the cycle, when we talk about a cycle hub, I think St George's Street, we're talking about cycle racks between trees, not necessarily a hub. The hub would be where we hopefully will get the cycle hire facilities, the docked stations, and we are looking, you know, Burgate Lane is, is definitely a better location for that if we can achieve it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, do, you want to, do you want to come back in, Alex? You're sort of poised there. I'm poised. And then we then, then Chris. <laughs> ready to strike. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for those comments. And again, just just to reiterate, as a, as a saying that the, the process is by no means ended at this stage. Um, I'm not sure if I'm able to to propose an amendment to delegate myself more authority, am I? But um, that's it's a slippery slope. Worry about that in a minute, Alex. Okay. Let's get the word um, right. Just just uh, specifically on on pound loan, which I think is a, is a, um, a a case in point of how closely these these things are being looked at, as that's already gone through and been discussed and. I completely agree that it's it's that whole area. Um, I mean, if you were, as I say quite a lot, if you were to choose a place to put a car park now, Pound Lane would not be it. Um, but we do have to deal with the way it is that you've got a very narrow entrance for a very large area. I understand there are things that can be done with AMPR to, to, to deal with flow within the car park. 
we will, as you're about to hear, and I don't want to spoil the next item for everyone because I know everyone's looking forward to it, that there will be some um, some money going on signage um, as part of the off-street parking, so we can have a look and see what we can do with that. But what I would point out with Pound Lane is it has been closed for a very long time already. So anybody that would habitually turn left out of Pound Lane on the way out or, or try and turn it... And to be honest with you, if you've ever tried to do that, it's quite a bad idea to try and get yourself onto that road, uh, theatre chucking out time anyway. So I think most people did probably go across the causeway even when it was open. So I don't think, I think the same thing has been said about walking and cycling through there. People are pretty used to having Pound Lane closed. It's almost a really, really good way if you were to introduce these proposals is to close the road for quite some time before you pedestrianise it um, so, that, so that actually that behaviour change will already have happened before it's come in. I know that was discussed in detail at JT be the other day but no um I'll, I'll, I'll pass over for the um um the, the the legal bit now on uh, on that amendment which i think is a great idea delegate more power to me please okay we deal with that word in the moment so uh chris do you want to come back on a few points sir yeah i i, I mean uh less comments than charlotte um i, I just wanted to, it, it strikes me essentially that the thing on um we might want to give ourselves some greater dispensation, but essentially we also have to come to some type of arrangement with county, county council. You know, this is about establishing some type of security for them in how we're operating. Yeah. I'm confident enough that the assurance we, we, we've received in, in comments here is that the, the plans are not just the flow of traffic, but also specific in relation to the materials essentially used. And I think deviations from that, which I think is Charlotte's concern, um, we would flag as essentially kind of like red flags that, you know, we're established. We've not, you know, we're not specifying kind of particular materials just for fun. We're, you know, we're highlighting them because we could uh, consider it important and that was what was part of a consultation. Um, so I, I, I if Richard thinks that there's sufficient assur uh, assurance and we're happy that that's how officers are going to proceed, I I'm happy with that as a, as a solution. I just wanted to essentially ch check as well. It it's good to hear the different parts of the LUF are talking, but it's useful to also ensure that the conversations for overview and scrutiny are shared amongst multiple parties of the LUF. And, you know, what's useful in here, I think, is... Uh, 2.10, where essentially you look specifically at the concerns in overview and scrutiny and specifically relate to them in a transport uh, issue. But I just wanted to make sure that points like the comment about accessible toilets at the bus station and that feeding into another consultation aren't necessarily lost, because whilst I appreciate they're not directly the responsibility of this report, that's an opportunity where members of the public have raised concern and councillors, and we want to make sure that they are logged and handed out to various different types of future life consultations going forward. Yeah, wise words. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> did I see Connie's hand? You did. I did. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Um, just, just a few points. First of all, um, I have very little confidence that KCC highways have any idea at all about how they should operate in a historic city, judging by the absolute debacle at Longport. Um, Mel was very good. Um, she and I met with the uh, with the engineer sort of halfway through. He took absolutely no notice at all um, of, of what I was saying. He took absolutely no notice at all of what the residents were saying. I'll give you one example. The um, historic uh, place where uh, there, there was um, a, a pump which I think should actually be highlighted, was given to the city um, by um, the Baronet Hales of Hales Place. The residents in that street were very worried that people would walk off with the pile of um, heritage-style um, cobblestones. He poo-pooed it, and what happened? Half of them blooming disappeared, and now we've got this ugly, ugly cement where there should be cobblestones. Now, I'm not saying that I have no confidence in somebody because they're not technically qualified. I'm sure he is. I'm absolutely sure he is. What, he, what KCC have not impressed me with is that they understand about a historic city. Hurrah, we've got the levelling up. 
money. And, and well done to, to Councillor Charlotte Cornell. I'm absolutely um, amazed and impressed with all the, the, the staff that have been doing with the consultations. It's absolutely brilliant. But let's not run away with the fact that it's going to be a huge operation going on in a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I would like to see some assurance, not just, not, I, I take your point, Councillor Dawkins, about a gentleman's agreement. No, I'd like to actually see KCC Highways people go on a course on how to work in a heritage city, because I have very little confidence in their competency in that at all. They have destroyed a historic view, quite wantonly, um, when you look up from Burgate Lane to um, the old cemetery gate, we've now got the ugliest post ever. That is a historic view which they paid no attention to at all. So my first point is, I don't trust them. I don't trust them that they understand that an historic, a UNESCO World Heritage City, that they have any idea at all. So I would like to see something quite you know, tighter than that. The second point is, um, <laughs> I'm quaking in my boots here, Councillor Ricketts, with your delegated authority. <laughs> well, just hang on, I'm nearly, I'm nearly there. First of all, as I understand it, this is a very different set of projects to, to the Longport one, and not least that, you know, um, I'd hope that I'd be able to keep a better eye on it, perhaps. Um, but we will be carrying out the work, so we will have a degree more control over this. Um, I mean, I do take your point that, that we, we've got not only that one, but there is another, there's another piece of work that's been carried out by KCC in the district, which is causing some consternation at the moment. Um, and as I said, that, that we do have a greater degree of control and scrutiny over these projects than we do from those, both in terms of the way these are being carried out and I suspect in terms of our attitude to these projects than, than those ones which went awry in the past. So I think that, the, that we, we will have a little bit more control over this one. Um, so yeah, just hopefully put your mind at rest on that point that we'll be able to do that. Um, and, and, and obviously those points are well taken. I think it's, uh, I, I think even, even if it was the same people undertaking the work previously, they would probably be aware of um, the outcome of, of the, the previous work and, and the um, controversy that's been caused there. So they're going to be a little bit more careful if they do get involved again in the future. Thank you. I, I want them to be a lot more careful. OK, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the second point that I wanted to come to, I'm, I'm a bit quaking in my boots with this delegated authority that you've got. Um, who's going to be checking up on you then? You. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the other thing I just wanted to say, um, I, I totally agree with what's been said previously. Um, let's not take away the planters because people are using them as rubbish bins. Let's put rubbish bins there as well. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, right. Um, I think I've taken a bit, bits of that. That's some, been quite useful, actually. Then. Probably, Richard probably feels a bit be beaten up over that, but I think, actually, it's been really positive, actually. So the, we've, we've also looked a lot of stuff there. That is, uh, we've got to look at that for a generational three, haven't we, really? And that's what it comes down to. Let's get it right. Uh, I was going to make a really simple amendment because it picks up on some of the Connie and, and Charlotte says. Um, it's microscopic, really. It says, it, um, the Cabinet Member for Tourism, Movement and Rural Development, in consultation with the Head of Transport and Environment, is given delegated authority to make any changes required by KCC and or Canterbury City Council. Because obviously, enough is part of Canterbury City Council, isn't it? And that would seem to to cover that. Is that an agreeable? Yeah. Oh, is that would, would that give you that confidence as well, Richard? In that you comment earlier, yeah. So, um, if you're happy with that, then that will be an amendment. So, so if if you could formally propose that, um, do I have to read it all out again? Uh, Can I formally actually, propose? Actually, I think it would be good to do that just okay. before we vote, if that's okay with you. So, um. Do we have to vote on that amendment and then read out the... 
So in fact, I've accepted that. So I'll reread the whole thing, and then that will be the proposal that I then make. OK. There we go. To resolve that the detailed designs shown on the drawings in appendices 2 to 5 relating to the following projects, Westgate Square, St George's Square, St George's Lane, Dane John to Castle via Castle Row Car Park, are agreed. That a Section 278 agreement is entered into with Kent County Council for the implementation of these projects. That the Cabinet Member for Tourism, Movement and Rural Development, in consultation with the Head of Transport and Environment, is given delegated authority to make any changes required by KCC and Canterbury City Council. I do so move. Okay. <laughs> did, did we have that seconded? I don't think we did. It was, it was but obviously it's changed slightly. Uh, are, you, are you happy to, to, to take that amendment? That's fine. Thank you for that. Uh, so in that case, we can vote. Show of hands. If there's no uh, um, counter votes, then we can agree that with a show of hands, if you can. Thank you for that. That was unanimous. Okay. Um, we are now going to move on to uh, item 13, which is the change of um, conditions in council car parks, pages 202 to 258. It's, if anyone wants a quick break, I think it's possibly a good time for a break. Do you want just five minutes break, if that's okay? And then we're, um, we'll come back in a moment. Be good. Yeah. The, yeah, just to be sure, the, um, the recording's going, um, so... We, and only five minutes, so anything you say will be recorded and transmitted. So, okay.
Okay. Thanks. Thanks all. I think we've all had a had a chill for a few moments or two, got a drink and whatever, and uh, now we can focus again and going forward. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Item 13 then, to propose changes and charges and conditions to council car parks, pages 202 to 258. Um, we can consider the report by Bill Hicks, Service Director, Place and Richard Moore, Head of Transport and Environment. The officer that will be looking after us this evening for questions in the primary sense of the word, we Richard Moore, Head of Transport and Environment. And the cabinet member who's going to be taking from this point onwards almost is Councillor Alex Ricketts. But who's the cabinet member for tourism, movement and rural development. So, um, again, there was lots of discussion at the overview and scrutiny committee. And I think we've all looked at those, taken those thoughts on board. They were really useful. Many of us were at the meeting as well. So um, good discussions, good debates, lots of consultation items, lots of reading. And um, I'll say it now, I was really, really pleased that so many people had taken the time and effort to actually write in. Um, with their thoughts and that. I mean, obviously not always agreeing with what we've done, let's be honest about it, but it was good to have their points of view. Um, so, um, if I could ask Councillor Ricketts to introduce the item and proposal for the Cabinet members um, and seek a seconder, yeah, same as you did uh, in, in your previous starring role. Over, over to you, Alex. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. I will, I will talk briefly before I read the, the wording of the proposal, because the wording of the proposal is, is, is a lot of numbers um, of, of items. So I thought it would be useful to actually put some, um, some colour around that before we go into. So what we're, what we're effectively <clears throat> um, going to resolve this evening, hopefully, should this be successful, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we will um, adopt the... Um, proposals that were made some time ago that went out to consultation, but with some changes that have been made as a result of that consultation. Um, as you may have noticed, it, it has caused a degree of debate. There have been a lot of um, conversations, a lot of feedback to the consultation and some really good discussion at overview and scrutiny the other night as well. Um, I've been out talking to a lot of people. Um, I think we all know that changes to car parking, particularly when that involves price rises, is going to cause a huge amount of um, concern among residents, quite rightly. Um, and I think I'd start off as I did when I introduced this item before it went out to consultation by saying, under no circumstances did I want to put prices up in any way, shape or form. I think that's, the, that's always going to be the first point, is how can we limit what what the impact will be but we do find ourselves in a financial situation as we are about here later on spoilers for another item again that that we have to do this and we do have to raise revenue we've already looked at council tax and and where this council can continue to provide its um essential services we have to fund it somewhere and unfortunately car parking prices is one of one of the uh, areas that we have control over with that background i think what we try to do and what the team have done brilliantly is to try and introduce some changes where we mitigate those um, those rises as much as possible across the district. There is some good news within this, which I will, if uh, Cabinet will indulge me, go through one more time, is that this does include the reopening of Sturry Road Park and Ride, something that we all agreed to do, which I think is an overwhelmingly popular, and actually the, 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 the couple of things I'll talk about were overwhelmingly popular in the consultation, that, that, that residents do clearly still want Sturry Road Park and Ride reopened. The consultation was very clear on that with the responses. And adding to that, that with the introduction of a residence rate, that all of the park and rides will be available for residents from as low as £3.20 a day to park all day in the park and ride, get a low emission bus into the centre of Canterbury, which I think is fantastic. Now, there has been some debate as to whether this is the cheapest park and ride in the country. We cannot find a definitive answer on this, but it is probably among the cheapest in the country. I will go out on a limb and say that. The ones that we've had a look at where the advertised price is lower, quite often what they're advertising is the price of parking and you then have to pay for a bus as well. So we haven't done a full deep dive on every park and ride in the country. But of the ones that we've had a look at, I think I will, I will, um, I'm not going to get into the point of making vain bets on things. That's got somebody in trouble recently. <clears throat> but um, I, I, I think that we, we can be rightfully proud of the fact that we are offering a very, very reasonable park and ride service there. We will also be restoring the three hour blue badge free limits in council car parks. And added to that as well, we talked about Pound Lane earlier on. 
we will be increasing the number of um, disability bays from 10 to 15 in Pound Lane. So we already have um, dedicated car parks for blue badge holders within the city centre as well. So we'll be increasing the provision and doing away with what was quite a, um, uh, I feel, discriminatory uh, measure to put that down previously. And the final one, of course, is the overarching point of the banding of the car parks across the district, having a district-wide parking policy and introducing a 10% residence rate within that. Now, this is an area that, that's caused a degree of um, consternation because when we have made for a, a, a consistent price across the district with these bands, that does mean that there are some slightly larger rate rises in some car parks than there are in other areas. But some of those car parks in the band three area will actually be cheaper as a result of these proposals. I would love for the local press to print the full price list as opposed to... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being heckled from the public gallery by, by, by what appears to be a sat-nav. Um, the park and ride is down the road. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes, some, some car parks will actually be cheaper with a residence rate as a result of these proposals. And, and that includes the, the likes of um, uh, Castle Street multi-storey um, and uh, Castle Row, Longport, St Radigan's. And, and within that as well, where we've not been able to apply a residence rate in Winchick, Gladstone Road, Shaftesbury Road and Victoria Street, um, although removing the uh, seasonal charging means that actually over the course of a year, if you were to park there every day over the course of the year, then that would actually be cheaper on a day-by-day -day basis in those car parks. And William Street in Hearn Bay will be uh, one of the cheapest car parks in the district with a residence rate at £1.70 an hour. Now, to move on to the changes that we made, we did listen in the consultation um, one of the key things, as we did mention, was removing the um, the free parking time in, in Whitstable. We listened to the concerns on that, and for the period of this order, um, we'll provide a 30-minute free period at Shaftesbury Road in Whitstable to ease the transition from that previous free period to allow people who aren't able to make other, um, other arrangements for the school run to be able to use that car park for drop-off, which we hope, and have spoken to quite a lot of people in the area, which we hope will ease that transition for people while they're able to make other arrangements. We still remain committed to the idea that um, we don't want to encourage people to um, drive on the school run. I think it's the national policy, it's the policy of a lot of schools that they want wherever possible for kids to come either by uh, walking or alternative transport means or ideally the bus. But we do understand that there would be some difficulty um, of just removing that straight away. We've also um, would hope to move Oyster Car Park and Beach Walk, which were going to go into band one. Uh, down to band two. We think that the way those car parks are managed and the way they are at the minute with the level of congestion that that would be manageable. I don't think it will encourage excess traffic to those um, and that would be in there. And we would keep the band two cap across the district at £20 a day so that like, those charges aren't punitive. That's everywhere, not just those two car parks. We've also, on the basis of um, some, some strong consultation responses and from, from my colleague um, with responsibility for, for the environment on, on Cabinet, um, we will be able to keep the 20% electric vehicle discount on annual parking permits. The, um, the rationale for removing that on parking prices was that this didn't really act as an incentive for um, adopting an electric vehicle if you got slightly cheaper parking in the district and with the residence rate as well then there, there are other incentives available. However, we can see that, that on parking permits, if you're making a decision on buying a car and you have a parking permit, a 20% discount on that permit would actually have um, a, a financial impact on your decision. So we decided to keep that as well. And we'll also be retaining the free overnight parking in William Street from 9pm to 7.30am as well, which um, which we hope will be will, will will be greeted at least slightly more positively by local businesses. These changes will cost approximately forty thousand um, pounds. They've been costed. Um, some excellent work's been done during the course of the consultation. They've been costed in, and you'll hear on the proposal that that we want those to be taken note. Unfortunately, that does mean that there's had to be some some savings made elsewhere. Part of these proposals is that we have reintroduced um, a budget for incentives. <laughs> Um, things like free parking around Christmas or parking for, for events and festivals. We wanted that to be actually quite a high budget. We wanted that to be somewhere in the region of, of £30,000 initially. The finances simply don't work, but I am pleased to say that we still managed to retain £15,000 for that in, in the, the parking budget. 
that's something that, that the ambition in the future is that we would like to expand that a lot more, that we can do that where we can we can have those. And I also want that to be taken in, in a way where I'll remove delegating authority myself. That, that should be a decision based on uh, on the corporate priorities of the council, not at the whim of a cabinet member or an elected official. So I would want that to be part of a decision-making process that, that happens with with the um, the head of transport. So I, I, I think that there's a lot in there, and there's a lot of detail in the report, but I'll, I'll make the proposal as it, as it stands at the moment. Those changes I've described, I'll, I'll refer to by their number in a minute, and they are available in the report. So I propose that Cabinet resolves that the changes are made to the advertised proposals in respect to items number 3, 6, 13, 14, and 35, as set out in the report that items number 1 to 54, which include the changes above, as set out in the Appendix 1, and the proposed permit charges, item number 55, as set out in Appendix 2, are implemented on the 1st of April 2024. That the financial impact of items 56 to 61 are taken into account in the 24-25 budget. I do so propose. Seconded. Thank, Thank you. you so seconded by Councillor Sol. Uh, I've watched this check. Does the officer want to correct anything or, or make or, or make any comments at all or, or, or sitting there in stunned silence and I'm which we all are so no that's fine. Obviously I know you went to take questions in a minute in that case, but we'll work our way around. So first is, is Councillor Sol, then Councillor Nolan, and then we come back. Thank you, Chair. No one likes putting up car parking charges, um, but the financial situation that we find ourselves in and every other local authority finds itself in means that there's, there's been no choice but to look at additional income sources from somewhere. And every other administration in the past has at some time put up car parking charges and they're not popular, and we know they're not popular. But what we have done this time is do things that we know are popular with the money that is being raised from car parking. And the consultation told us this, you know, bringing back three hours of blue badge parking, reopening the park and ride, those are things that um, people who responded to the consultation were, really wanted us to do, and we're, and we're doing this. The three pound twenty for you know, a car to park in the park and ride with with six people in it, you know, fantastic rate, and and that will be be good for the environment, be be good for the city, and and I'm particularly pleased. Um, one thing from our Liberal Democrat manifesto last time was a residence rate for car parking, um, something that it, I tried to introduce a number of years ago, but now we've got it, and because of that, you know. Somewhere between 10 or 12, I can't remember the exact number, but I'll probably be corrected on this, of our car parks will be cheaper for residents next year than they are this year. And that's going to you know, put more money back in the pockets of people that they can then go and spend in the high streets if they want to. So you will be able to park in the district, if you're a resident of this district, somewhere cheaper than you can currently park, if you don't mind, just perhaps just walking a little bit further. So I think this is a, a really good set of proposals. It's been a, a much a much needed reform and simplification of car parking. And I'm, I'm really pleased that when we looked at the consultation responses, we, we studied those and we did all that we could to make changes and reflect those. And I think that's the, the benefit of people taking part in a consultation process early on when we've got time to amend them. And I, I'm really glad we, we've done that. And where people made comments that we haven't been able to do anything with this year, we will bear those in mind. And when we look at car parking in the future, we can monitor the activity in the car parks. And if we need to reflect, you know, make changes in the, in the future to reflect um, any impact, you know, if we suddenly see that car parking is dropping off in some car parks, well, we don't want that ourselves because we're, we need the income from it, and if that drop off is affecting local businesses, we can move to reflect, move to, to change that in the future. But I, whole, I wholeheartedly support these proposals. It's a fantastic piece of, of work. It was a, it was a difficult piece of work that Councillor Ricketts did, and, and I'm very pleased 
that we're going forward with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Chris? Yes, oh, well, Connie was technically first. Can we, can we... On, Connie, it's, my, it's me. I forgot. I know, what was I it? know. I'm, I'm so <laughs> small, you see, I disappear into the background. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a wee leprechaun here. Um, OK, so, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to, to thank um, Councillor Ricketts and the officers because um, I know it was sort of a Herculean task. Um, I also know how unreasonable as a cabinet we were about listening to the residents. Um, just, just going back a, a few years, I, um, I think closure of Sturry Park and Ride first came up on the Regeneration Committee. And I'd like to share with you, I used to call it the Let's Close It Down Committee because um, all we ever did was, was close things down. And I'd like to really commend the, the, the hard work that the officers have put in under the guidance of, of Councillor Rickett to actually think constructively. And I'm so pleased that the Sturry Park and Ride will reopen. It's something that we were very keen on. I know from, from sort of the, the, the passionate debates that we had against shutting it down, nobody wanted it shut. You know, I, I also remember one, one councillor who wasn't re-elected, but I won't, I won't, I'll spare his blushes, who said that um, it was good that the new Dover Road park and ride would be kept as it had a dedicated bus lane. Of course, my arm shot up then, as it's in my ward, um, to point out that the uh, dedicated bus lane was um, from the park and ride that they were going to close down. I mean, tsh they didn't know what they were talking about, honestly. What a shower. Moving on, um, I just want to also say I had a lot of um, emails from uh, wheelchair users who told me that two hours was not enough time for them to sort of um, take advantage of shopping and, and so forth, and that they felt restricted, especially if they were a, a family um, where one of the parents was a wheelchair user or, or one of the children was a wheelchair user. And, and those of us that, that have had small children know how difficult it can be to round them up at the best of times. So um, I'd like to also thank the, the work that the officers and, and Councillor Ricketts put in in restoring that one hour. I thought it was a mean thing to do, to, to cut back to two hours. And I think I probably said so at the time. It'd be unlike me if I didn't. Um, I also want to say, uh, well done for the three bands. I don't think, well, I know that the local paper has got itself very exercised about it, but, um, you know, they're not looking at the fact that there are choices. And I, I, in life, there's always choices. You can either pay top dollar or you can park somewhere which is relatively cheaper and walk. And, and I'd like to see, not that I'm suggesting any officer time is, is spent on it, but I'd like to see if we really are the cheapest um, with, with Sturry Park and Rye, because that would be one in the eye, wouldn't it, for some people? There we go. Um, the other thing that I just want to say is I'm delighted that there's a little bit of leeway already in the budget for financing sort of, you know, Christmas parking. And of course, the other thing is the economics of car parking is that we make a punt on how much money we're going to get. But actually, you know, if, if as we have plans to draw more and more people in on a tourist, on a, um, a heritage and on a cultural basis, those um, car parking uh, fees may well be more. So all in all, I'd like to say it's a brilliant piece of work. Thank you to the officers and to Councillor Rick. Yeah, thank you for that, Connie. Um, Chris. <clears throat> Yes, I, I just wanted to kind of pick up on uh, uh, Mike's point about the fact that this has been a consultation. People have suggested things and we have listened. Um, I appreciate that there's a, a large proportion of shopkeepers in Whitstable who were particularly worried. Uh, that's normally for me epitomised by Kelvin, who's my local butcher, who, if I buy a pound of sausages, always talks to me about car parking charges. Uh, and it's been quite nice this week to actually be able to start having a proper conversation with them about uh, you know, what we're doing, because Calvin's normally concerned about keeping regular customers. Um, and whilst he'd love it that we kind of milked tourists for all the, uh, that they ha have, I've been able to explain that this is, that our changes to car parking here have both introduced a residence rate, which will benefit it, 
and essentially are also helping people who have got local knowledge to identify car parks which are slightly more beaten off, uh, off a beaten track. So um, the truth is that the prices which are increasing are not car parks, which, to be honest, most of his regulars actually end up using. Um, but what we've really tried to do is keep costs down in and around the high street where we can. Um, and actually kind of really positively from the consultation, also kind of change that ratio to f when we can find car parks where we could drop. So in Beach Street and Oyster, um, we kind of uh, have done so, you know, and actually that some of the car price, uh, parking prices are actually going down in some of the car parks that he, uh, that he can recommend um, his regulars to, I think is really positive. I'd also just like to, to thank Alex for the work of going out to speak to local communities. It was, uh, it was a brave man who uh, turned up on a Tuesday night to uh, speak to members of the uh, local community in Whitstable about this. But he came out uh, quite well. And uh, the conversation, particularly about how we can support schools to, um, and parents to uh, reduce their reliance essentially on dropping kids off, I think was a useful conversation. And there's some... Uh, some pragmatic solutions here about how we can work with schools to deal with uh, the particular problems that we have in and around the uh, Whitstable High Street. So, uh, yeah, I'd concur with him that if a local press would actually kind of like bother reading the nuance of these points, there's actually a lot more interesting things to say rather than just highlight the increase. You can highlight our local businesses uh, nearby, how low some of their car parks actually are. I'll let Alex come back on that, and then I've, I've got Pip as well. Pip Hoseman, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I would like to uh, continue the traditional um, cabinet um, loving between myself and Councillor Cornell, um, and, and thank him as I as, as I failed to do in my initial um, <laughs> initial points. And, and genuinely, he's been invaluable in um, taking the temperature of local feeling, which is often quite high. And I suspect running interference for me with a lot of um, a, a lot of comments that came back where he had to bear the brunt of it before people came to me. And, and it made my life a lot easier that, that he'd already done a lot of the work of, of explaining these proposals before I went to speak to them as well. And not quite holding my hand at, at various forums, but certainly being a supportive voice in the room. I, I think that hopefully through this process where it started off as quite adversarial with with some of these groups that i've actually been able to build some conversations help them to understand that these proposals are part of a wider transport and environmental policy that, that this this council wants to bring in and and it's actually been very useful to speak to people even though it's come from a, a position initially of them um, quite quite rightly being very concerned about some of the the elements within here that, that actually that has really fostered some fantastic debates and discussion and, and Councillor Cornell has been a huge part in making that happen. So, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, it was uh, Councillor Hazelton next. Thank you for that, Alice, by the way. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so, so I was particularly struck at the uh, ONS uh, discussion the other week um, when a, a member of the business community uh, spoke up as a member of the public concerned particularly about, um, about business at the Westgate Halls and the increased charges at, at Pound Lane and uh, concerns from certainly one of, one of the people who, um, who hire the hall there and... Um, women leaving late at night and needing to use that car park. And I was, and it has troubled me, you know, the, the idea of like, you know, women's safety and leaving, leaving venues at night. But I think there was some member of ONS, I think it was um, uh, Councillor Carr Ellis, made the point that actually the answer to nighttime safety is not via a car park strategy it's about us designing uh, you know and working in the future to make sure that um, our cities and I'm particularly thinking about Canterbury city centre here is a safe place for people to move around at all times of day and night and that women you know leaving whether it's an exercise class or or, or, or leaving the theatre or you know going out for a social drink or whatever that that's a safe place for everyone and I would very much um, 
like to see, as I hope we intend to as a council, to move forward to make nighttime safety for, for all people, but particularly women and girls, a, a priority, and that doesn't need to be via a car park strategy. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, <coughs> Councillor Hazelton. And uh, I, I believe Alex will tell us how much money it is that we've set aside in this budget to do some work, just a tiny, tiny step uh, towards making our, one of the multi stories car parks at Castle Street even that little bit safer than it needs to be. It's a full small step, there's more to do, but can you fill me in the details? And then we come back to, to Mel after you, if I can. Yeah. Actually, how much is the... it's, 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 it's not a small amount, it's 300,000 uh, for the improvements to multi-storeys. So, um, and, and we're really aware of that. And I think that there are serious concerns about um, Castle Street multi-storey, that is, probably the, 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 the prime location that we would direct residents to with the residence rate to use. And we're really aware of the fact that that is um, not ideal in its current state. And that's work that we really wanted to do. I know, well, not we, but it's work that the team have really wanted to do for a long time. There's a lot that needs to be done there and, and it also will require constant monitoring. But of course, the best, um, the best remedy for making sure that these places are safer is having more people use them. And, you know, if you've got a busy, well-used car park with lots of people there, you know, safety in numbers and 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 lots of eyes on things as well. Not just in terms of safety, but in terms of in terms of it being um, kept well and people reporting things and and people going out. If you use it regularly, you want to make sure it's kept well, um, and lots more help from residents to do that as well. And there is also within that, and I'm really mindful because I've had those conversations with the bid and with lots of businesses in Canterbury as well. That that, that Pound Lane is 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 an issue. Um, and we've heard tonight with the congestion problems with Pound Lane, we've heard tonight that, that the environmental impact that that has, and that is the reason that it that it is in band one, along with the other ones, where they're in the most congested and busy areas. We're really mindful, particularly with the users of Westgate Hall, that, that a lot of them aren't particularly financially well off. We do have this pot for incentives um, within the budget for things like Christmas and stuff. That's something that we'd like to expand in the future if we can. And as the point was made, by Councillor Nolan that, that hopefully if more people use these car parks and the budget increases then there's something that we can do there in the future of ploughing more of that back into those incentives and those things to help businesses. We're not in the business here of making excess profits, we're in the business here of just about paying for what we want to be able to do in, in the short term. So if more money does become available for that then, then we obviously will try and make do whatever we can to try and help those businesses and, and car park users. So thank you for those. Yeah, thanks, for that. Alex. That was more, a bit more of a leap than a, than a small step, wasn't it? Really. So you're right. Actually, I was just <laughs> so that, that's good news. Thank you for that, um, Mel. <clears throat> okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for the report. And um, I just want to sort of give my take on it. Um, yeah, it's been a really challenging time, hasn't it? We've got a lot of feedback about our parking. It's probably the biggest. Uh, contentious issue so far but you know we've got you know putting it a different perspective of it on it we've got a job to do we've got to reduce emissions we've got to combat congestion we've got to improve air quality and we've got to encourage air active travel and this is and as you've mentioned this is just all part of a bigger strategy the transport strategy which we'll be seeing in a in a few weeks hopefully and it's going to public consultation consultation so those are all that those are the drivers that's driving this whole thing um you know and as you've said there's going to be opportunity to review because we've got this amazing technology that allows us to make lots of graphs and see how it's having an impact on businesses and if we're making the revenue that we're saying we're going to do and then we're going to come back to it so you know it's not it's all done for a reason and of course there's the state of affairs by the government that councils have to raise their own revenue and you know that every council in the whole of the country has to make money and car parking seems to be the one that does it and we've been left with the debt that we have to to fill so those all those the things that we're looking at and why we're here now um but i am looking forward to pushing the climate agenda and the messaging about these bans because it's given people choices to park for way for cheaper and walk into the city, and that's promoting active travel. Also, also the messages such as the reduction on carbon emissions and built areas of Canterbury, Whitswell, and Herne Bay. So, if more people choose to park for a way in the band two or three or the park and ride, they're not going to be chugging their cars in the centre of town. Um, or and also, what is it? The particles 
2.5. That comes with the tyres as well. So even if you have an EV, you're still polluting with your tyres. So, um, so I have made, you know, I'm looking forward to having those conversations with you guys about the marketing, how we market our bands and uh, the five, one to five coded by carbon savings or, uh, or the impact on emissions. Um, and even, I think you, I don't know if you came up with it or me or I think you would, about how many steps you're going to be taking. You know, there could be sort of a point in town. So if you park in Castle Street, I'm using Canterbury because that's where I live, um, how many steps it would take to get to not McDonald's, but like a, like a <laughs> how many steps it's going to take if you park that little bit further away and what that how and how that's improving your health so those are all really good marketing strategies that we could be using to support what is a bigger plan the transport strategy um and it's not going to be one year two years it's 10 years 15 years 20 years um and we really do need to get these emissions down um just a little point that you picked up on about businesses and i did uh, pick up on that at the ONS as well there was a lot of concern and there have been a lot of concerns from businesses and you know I know we're going to keep an eye on it I know you're going to keep an eye on it um, but you know they are really they are worried about losing business and uh, I think yeah it was the Westgate Hall that was here they're a community trust and they host a lot of organizations and workshops and stuff like that so if people park in the pound line obviously you know, and they're worried that some of those workshops are going to disintegrate, if it were, because people don't want to pay that those higher charges. So, if we can really, maybe we could even con keep in contact. With, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just let's get this done and get start getting the positive messages out there. And and I'm really looking forward to the transport trustee. I can't believe I just said that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, thank you. And thank you, Alex, and thank you, uh, Richard. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you for that, Mel. And, and uh, yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think one thing I, I think I'd like to hear a little bit more b before we vote actually about the uh, the marketing of this. Um, it's really, I mean, we time and time again, we've repeated the theme that we all know as cabinet members that this is part of the bigger picture, you know, as a, as a, an administration and, and as a cabinet, we are not ashamed in saying this is the bigger picture. This is the way that we're going to move forward. It's a forward thinking council that's determined to do its bit towards the environment and biodiversity and everything else. And we won't do that if we're just worried about a bit of tiny detail. This is the big picture. This is part of the big picture. This is what we're thinking about today. Lots more to follow. But I'm not ashamed to be putting that big picture first. So uh, just a bit more about that marketing, because I think that helps people to understand why we're serious about this. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. That's a really good point, actually. And, and within this budget, you will see that there, there, um, there's significant funds put aside for marketing campaign mm -hmm. for this, more than, more than I think we would have ever done in the past. And within that as well, I, I sort of put them together as, as one thing, is the signage for the car parks. So we will have very good... Um, and these these sort of proofs are, are under 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 construction at the moment. We'll have um, very good clear colour coding with each of these bands, and that will be made very very obvious as to before you turn into a car park, before you sort of commit to paying which which level of car park you're going to be turning into, and and how much that's likely to cost you. We don't want to catch people out with these changes. That's the key thing through this. We will be doing a, a wide ranging uh, marketing campaign, including press and, and radio and posters, both in the district and, and in the wider area, because obviously a lot, a lot of the catchment area, particularly for the Sturry Road Park and Ride is actually outside the district to the east. Mm -hmm. We want people to know where the park and rides are first and foremost, and we want people to use them. We also want people to use the, the reason we're doing this banding is because we want people to park in these band two and band three car parks. We don't want people to be using the band one car parks as much as they are. Of course, they're still there and there's still the provision there, but it, it comes at a price. If you want to drive into the center of our, our, our various areas and, and that congestion that, that will be caused by that, then that comes at a certain price. So the marketing campaign, which you've already seen the, the, um, the early stages of, and it's looking really, really good. I think there's some fantastic work going into it. 
um, but but the clarity of those bandings of the three the three car park bands and, and the park and ride as well, I, th I hope will become a message that, that everybody uh, in in the district and and wider will understand and will will be able to get on the back of. And I do hope that 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 will be covered widely in the press when that that campaign goes out as well. Um, because that's something that will, will help residents. It's something that I hope people will share. And, and we've already seen this in terms of the, the, the various bits of pricing that go on at the moment. Um, whenever anybody comments on it, then people are very quick to go, well, you know, there's actually a cheaper car park down the road. And as, as Mel said as well, it's not actually that much of a difference between some of the band three car parks and some of the band one car parks, particularly in Canterbury. You, you're talking you're talking a very small um, small distance people. And if you are able to make those those extra steps, then it, it really does repay that. And and I think hopefully that will help businesses that are in perhaps uh, areas with less footfall as well that, that particularly we were looking with the, with the Whitstable car parks that if you are going to park in some of these car parks that you you know if you are going to the um to the seafront you'll actually have to walk past some of those businesses in the high street to get there from those car parks which hopefully will will help but yes we, we've got a, a very very good full well-planned well-designed marketing campaign which i don't want to ruin it now for you but it will be dropping soon that's, that's good to hear thank you for that any other comments by anybody Okay, right, let's just get my act together and then we we'll, we'll do the voting. <laughs> okay, we've got the micro IT. Anyway, we'll carry on. Right, in this particular vote, if there's no dissent particularly, or if there is, we deal with it differently, um, we can vote by a show of hands for this to resolve this item. You know, as we're voting to get it in place. Okay, that is unanimous. Right, so um, this is nowhere near as exciting, this next item. Um, um, I know Richard is putting his coat on because he's had enough excitement for one night. So thank you for tonight, Richard. We appreciate your help tonight. And that's really much welcome. Um, so this item 14, the general fund uh, revenue and capital budgets 2024 and 25, pages 259 to 390. I'm begin, um, we're going to consider the report by Tricia Marshall, Director of Corporate Services, and paid to, and Nikki Marshall, who's the uh, head of... Um, uh, service director for finance and procurement officer and section 151 officer. So the lead officer on this particular item is uh, Nikki Mills, who's the service director, as we said before, finance and procurement, section 151 officer. And the cabinet member is Mike Solon for his third act tonight, um, who's the cabinet member for finance. <clears throat> so again, um, I know we've talked about this before and We've all taken account of the comments on this in the overview and scrutiny committee, which we've all reflected on, I'm sure, and, and heard. So we, we've taken those into a view of our decisions tonight, and we thank the overview and scrutiny committee for those. Um, and what I'd like to do now is to ask uh, Councillor Sol to introduce the item um, and propose it. Um, and we're going to recommend that to set the full council moment. So. Um, and you might as well uh, get a second if you can, uh, Mike, at the same time. And then we, we move through and, and open the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm disappointed you don't think this is an exciting item. <laughs> I'm Sorry, to I've had a lot of excitement about car parks early on. So this is just a, a listing item uh, that, I, that I did read thoroughly, um, but it, I think I'd have preferred a novel. but. The content was was very important, so we've, we've gone for it. Well, I will introduce you to the joy of spreadsheets another day. Um, when this came to overview and scrutiny, um, obviously the main the main items talked about there were car parking, which we've already discussed. The only real item discussed on the general budget was to do with the market, and they were operational questions that were answered on the night. So I don't think there was really anything at all from that meeting um, <laughs> That had to be reflected again within this budget. I'm, I was very pleasing that so many people responded to the consultation process, supporting the return of the market and the reopening of the park and ride. 
Um, and we carefully looked at all of the comments. And I am, as, as you mentioned yourself, very grateful that residents and, and, and groups took time to give us their views. And even if we didn't have the financial headroom this year to make any changes, we can bear those comments in mind when we go through the budget process next year. Uh, the report before us um, shows where the, some amendments to the budget where it's been updated on page 261 and appendix 1.3 for revised information on government grants and changes that we've been able to make as part of the consultation on car parking charges. So no other real comments. I mean, we, we'll get into the detail of this, no doubt, when we come to full council. Um, so I, I would like to make the recommendation, and it's quite a long recommendation if you'll you'll bear with me. So I recommend that A, that the council approves the net revenue budget amount of £20,817,234 for 24-25. B, that the council approves a council tax band for band D of £239.91 pence for 2024-25, an increase of 2.9% when compared with 23-24. C, that the council approves a financial plan for 24-25 and 25-26 set out in Appendix 1 as the basis for the budget in each of those years with the projected council tax increase being limited to not more than 2.99% each year. D. That in order to deliver a robust budget for future years, the Council continues to identify further opportunities to generate additional savings. E. That the fees and charges set out in Appendix 3 be approved. F. That the movements in reserve set out in Appendix 4 be approved and G, that authority be given to incur expenditure on schemes brought forward in the capital programme since the council meeting in February 2023 for 2024-25 set out in Appendix 2. H, that subject to any alterations necessary, the draft capital programme set out in Appendix 2 be adopted as a basis for planning the approved capital budget. And I, that authority be given to the Head of Paid Services, Director of People and Place, Director of Strategy and Improvement and Service Directors to incur expenditure and otherwise exercise the powers delegated to them in the Constitution in order to implement the Capital Programme. J. That the cost recovery fees and charges highlighted in AMBA in Appendix 3. Officers are able to further increase or decrease charges during the year by up to 5% if costs vary in consultation with the Chair of Cabinet. And finally, K, that authority is given to the Director of Finance and Procurement, Section 151 Officer, to make any necessary amendments to individual budget lines following the final local government finance settlement in line with existing environment rules that does not alter the net revenue budget requirements. Do I have a seconder for that, please? <laughs> Councillor Dixie, thank you very much for that. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Obviously, I'll make further comments on the budget when we get to full council. Yeah, that, that's fine. Thank you very much. So anyone to make comments tonight uh, about anything at all? Um, I've got uh, Councillor Dawkins and, and Councillor Ricketts. Um, thank you, and thank you, Councillor Sol. Just a really, really small one. Um, if you look at the recommendations D, uh, I was just wondering if we should include and revenue. Uh, do that. It says additional savings and... Can I ask some clarity on Nikki on that? Is, is that a standard sentence we put in there, or...? Can we add and revenue? Is there any reason why we can't? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's implied that savings is revenue as well. It's that sort of local authority that, that savings are actually like income, aren't they? Kind of thing. It's a bit of a bit of an odd one, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. And that's how you stacks of savings and. Uh, coming up in the, uh, the the green agenda, are they? You know, just uh, you know, the last topic discussed. You know, kind of relevant. But... Yeah, thanks, Alex. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I'll probably, uh, as uh, Mike said, get on my hind legs and, and, and hold forth at full council more on this one. But I just wanted to say, and, and again, I think it bears repeating through this process, obviously, um, Mike warning us all that we can't do anything because there's no money. And then um, in, in concert with Nikki and the finance team, being able to actually deliver the stuff that's being delivered in this budget <clears throat> set against the, the background of, of um, reduced government funding, the, the state of the economy and everything that we've got to deal with, I think is, is, is nothing short of financial wizardry. Uh, and, and furthermore, to the officers having to work with Mike, having to work with a new administrator. <laughs> Furthermore, to the officers, uh, delighted to have worked with Mike, but having to work with a new administration and probably take us through this budget process whilst also dealing with one of the most difficult budget processes that, that they'd have to deal with. I was supposed to be paying you a compliment, Mike. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think this is a, a fantastic piece of work to, to, to get where where we are now with this um, is, 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 is absolutely brilliant work. And it's been it's been a pleasure to watch everyone put it together. So thank you for all the work in it. And I'm sorry again, Mike. Thank you, Alex. And and uh, it, it, does, <laughs> does, <laughs> does anyone have anything else to say? So, does, does anyone? Okay, I'll, I'll just I was going to say something actually um, before the razzmatazz of the the full budget meeting. I, I'd also like to probably echo many of the thoughts that we were sitting here saying is that I think the <clears throat> I'd say now on the record that my thanks go out to the whole officer team, especially. Um, who have got in our heads and understood a new administration going in a different direction. You know, and perhaps the last item about car parking is an illustration of, of how you change direction when, when you need something to happen. Um, we're grateful for that. We know we've been a complete pain. You've had a lot of learning and, and lots of teaching to do. And um, we've got even more learning to do. So we, we're grateful for that and we thank you for that. And preparing, and as you know, Mike has said many times, you know, to get in this budget over the line, and reflecting what we as a new administration wanted to achieve, achieving a great deal, not everything, of course, as Nikki keeps telling us, you could do some things, but not everything. Um, but <clears throat> all those things, um, we're proud to do that. We're proud to be part of this council, and um, this was something that you know we're, we're also proud that we've done. And we, we thank the, the officer team that have helped us get here. And uh, that's something that we take into that council meeting. Better to say it now while it's quiet and calm, rather than the, uh, the razzmatazz that no doubt we will um, have to uh, um, work along with at council. So thank you for all of you. Please pass it on to your teams, um, the top to bottom of the team as well, because I know every single person has been putting together on that. So thank you for all of you. It's been proposed and seconded and ably read by um, Councillor Sol the, the recommendation. So if there's no uh, reason not to, we'll take a show of hands again to show assent for that item. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Just for the record, that is a recommendation to Paul Council, as you probably realise. Okay, next item is item 15, which is nearly as exciting as the last one. Um, but this one is a housing revenue account and capital budgets 24-25, pages 391 to 418. And again, um, a huge amount of work has gone in by officers on this particular one. And those same lessons have been learned in this budget, which is, as I've said the last time around. So, um, so we're going to consider now a report by Nikki Mills, Service Director of Finance and Procurement, Section 1, uh, 151 Officer, and Marie Royal, Service Director for People. The officers that are going to look after us tonight on this item are Gary Peskett, Housing Strategy Manager, and Nikki Mills, Service Director of Finance and Procurement, Section 151 Officer. Um, uh, Councillor Mike Sowell is going to um, speak on this and, and address it, um, but also there's a linked portfolio here through Councillor Pip Hastern, who's a cabinet member for housing. Um, again, this was uh, 
debated and, and talked through at OV and scrutiny, and we've taken those comments and thoughts on board. And again, there was some good stuff noted there. Um, so uh, I'm going to invite um, Councillor Sol to um, propose uh, the recommendations to full council, and obviously seek a, a seconder as well, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm glad I get to speak again because I get to um, to thank Nikki and her team for all the work on the budget, which um, which has been been fantastic, and also to um, to welcome Rob May here as well as our new um, finance director. To um, I look forward to working both of them on on next year's budget as as we all do. Uh, the HRA account is, is is much more simpler, I think, for everyone to get their heads around. You know, in simple terms, tenants pay rent and we spend that rent maintaining their properties um, at the overview and scrutiny committee comments were raised mainly of an operational nature and responded to by officers so I, again we there are no changes to the budget here from what we talked about before the, there's no hiding though from the fact that with an aging housing stock and increases in inflation of outstripped rents things are very tight um, and you know this can't carry on forever. But I'm very much looking forward to working with Councillor Hazelton and officers on a on a medium and long term plan for housing a housing strategy in due course because we we do need to to look at this. Our reserves in the HRA are are, are now getting very low. But we are where we are. So for now, I would just like to uh, make the recommendation that the Council approves the draft housing revenue and capital budget in appendices A to C. And Councillor Hazleton will second that. Thank you very much, sir. That's good. Okay. It's open to debate. Any comments that uh, you want to make? Uh, Councillor Hazleton. Thank you. And. Um... Yes, I want to to thank all the officers for for the work that they've done on this. And um, in at overview and scrutiny, there were there were some comments and there were some concerns about um, about the um, uh, service charges. I think in particular that um, because of the cost of, um, of utilities, basically. And the, they rose even higher than had been profiled for, I think, for, for, for last year. And so, so there was some discussion around that. Um, and then I wasn't able to attend the residents' engagement panel, which uh, happened, I think, on Monday of this week. But um, I'm particularly interested in hearing back, and I think um, Gary uh, Peskett, as our officer, can. would you be kind enough to report back on what the residents' engagement panel had to say about that and any other comments that you might like to make? Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Marie and I met with the residents' engagement panel on Monday. Um, we had quite a, a robust and wide-ranging uh, discussion with them. Um, and at the end, we, we took a vote on, on their opinions on, on the recommendations for increasing the rent, increasing service charges, and increasing the garage rents. And uh, the rent increase and the garage uh, rent increase, those proposals received their unanimous approval and uh, the proposal about the service charges, uh, only one person abstained, all the others voted in favour, and the person that abstained only did so because they don't pay service charges and felt it was wrong of them to, to voice an opinion. So I think we can say that we've had really positive feedback and a very good level of understanding from the residents' engagement panel about the, about the proposed budget. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Marie, that's relevant to theory? Okay. So, okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> I'll just make one comment there on the, um, and I'll get Nikki to sort of sum up any, any bits of finance that you might want to do. Do you want to have a chat on that? Yeah, okay. I was just going to really say then that, um, you know, obviously the, the HRA has been beaten up in many, many directions over the last few years. Um, 
with rent freezes, of course, um, which don't help the payment of loans and um, and so on and so forth. But also, again, reflecting on the thing I talked about earlier on, politically, we're quite comfortable with having a long-term view of housing. Um, and we're very, very proud and pleased to be working towards a much longer-term view of our housing. And this is just the first year of that longer term view and um we uh we're happy with that and we uh we move forward and hopefully we can get our housing stock back into some sort of shape after the abysmal uh failure of of um <clears throat> east kent housing um which we've we're having to work our way through and that's history now so there's no point in whining about that but we've got to get on and sort that out as well so thank you team thank you for that um i'll just pause for a moment to check in yeah again if you're happy to um to recommend uh that report to full council then we can show do that by a show of hands okay so this is the last substantive item on our agenda I was expecting some sort of comment there, but that's not, not okay. So this is um, uh, a, uh, a rather um, helpful item, but this is also got a uh, exempted. Uh, it's got also uh, material and, and items, and uh, the report is also private. And if we want to debate anything on the private part of this uh, item, then we will need to go into private session. We don't have to. We've, I think we've all read it in our own time. Um, so if we're all happy with it, but we, of course we can if we wish to. Is anyone happy with that? Okay. In that case, um, we can consider now in open session a report by Susie Wakeham, Director of, Public, uh, Director of People and Place, and Marie Royal, Service Director for People. The officer who's going to be looking after the details tonight is Gary Prescott, Housing uh, Strategy Manager, uh, Marie Royal, Service Director of People and Place, and, uh, and the Service Director. So, um, Councillor Hazelton is going to be introducing the item. Um, and uh, this is a recommendation to full council, um, which is what we're doing. So, if, uh, if Pip could say a few words to introduce it to start with, and obviously, um, make the proposal and seek a seconder. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Okay, so um, the recommendation to full council is that um, um, we consider the observation and comments of overview and scrutiny committee in the merits of the proposal and that the council resolves to approve the purchase of the new affordable homes for the price specified in the confidential annex. Can I have a seconder, please? Um, Councillor Dawkins. Uh, thank you. Um, so what I'd really like to say is, well, I just want to stand on the table, really, and dance, <laughs> <laughs> dance a jig, because, um, but no, I won't. <laughs> Maybe I'll save that for full council. Um, I, I, th I think what's, um, what's so pleasing to me is in the early stages of this new administration that uh, the officers have absolutely listened to what our priorities are and have gone out and, and, and looked for and found a fantastic opportunity to acquire high quality new housing stock um, to, to add to um, our council um, housing portfolio. Um, and it, it's true that our housing revenue account is, you know, it is, uh, it's quite fragile. And so, you know, we have been advised, you know, wisely, I think, by officers about not to overextend ourselves in terms of the number of numbers and, uh, of properties. But it does represent um, a very good deal for us. One of the things that um, I'm also really pleased about, in overview and scrutiny, people were um, 
raising the question of whether affordable homes as part of a, a general um, scheme would be of a similar quality, particularly in terms of energy performance. Um, as, you know, as the rest of the stock on, on, in that development. And I'm really pleased that um, um, officers, well, Gary, basically, has spoken to the developer and we can confirm that they will all be EPCB, which is, uh, which is really, really pleasing. And that, there, you know, there's a lot more detail, which I won't go into um, t tonight. But I think it's an entirely uncontroversial and, you know, entirely to be welcomed um, uh, project. And I'm really proud and pleased that we can bring it forward. Thank you. OK, um, I've got uh, Mike and, uh, and then Alex, please. Thank you, Chair. We, we've talked tonight about a, a few things in the budget that we're very pleased we're doing the market park and ride and so on but they're all completely dwarfed by this and and I'm 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 proud to be part of an administration that's doing this and although I can't claim any credit for it myself I I will do now, <laughs> now, I, I think it, I think it's absolutely fantastic we are providing roofs over people's heads and that that's the most important thing that we can do for people and and we're able to do it in a in a financially sustainable way, which is which is so important too. I, I really hope that this is the first of many similar projects we do over our term, providing significantly more homes for people than the previous administration did. And it's something that at the end of our four years, whatever happens after that, we'll be able to look back on this and say we did good. So I'm very pleased. Thanks, Mike. Over to you, Alex. Yeah, again, and Mike said the word there, which is which is pride, and I think um, I'm proud to be be involved in this and part of this decision. And I'll, I'll raise my hand, which was the absolute limit of the effort that I've put into making this happen. Um, but I think the officers should be very, very proud um, for for bringing this forward, and and Pip as well. I think you know if we can make this a model going forward and and i think that's the point is this is what we this is what we get involved in local politics to do is <laughs> is that there's going to be families here with a not just a roof over their head but a fantastic environmentally friendly really nice new build house because of um the work the officers have done behind this as well and i'm very proud to play a very small part in that if we can do more of this and i don't want to taint it by going yeah you've done this now what's your next trick but <laughs> But I think this is this sets the tone brilliantly, um, and I know Pip will be driving hard for that. But I think this is the sort of thing we want to hear, and this is what we this is what we all what we knock doors for, and why we put ourselves up here to do this kind of thing. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be involved in it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Concur with all of that. Um, if there's nobody else wants to to comment on that, um, then we can. Um, Recommend this to full council by a show of hands. Have, do you know everybody voted for that? That's fantastic. <laughs> I think even the officers. Let's do some tidy up at the end of the meeting. Um, so date and time of the next meeting is uh, 7 p.m. on Monday, the 11th of March. That's a special meeting. For the local plan, isn't it? Yeah. And that's a special meeting where we'll be dealing with a local plan, you might recall that. So that's, uh, I think rightly we've set a whole meeting aside for that um, and uh, we can take our time and work through that carefully. Um, I don't think there's any other business that we need to deal with in public, a surgeon. No. Okay, so we can move on there. Um, we didn't need to exclude the press and public. Um, so that can be ignored, that's okay. Part 20 and 21, we don't need, do we? Um, okay. So, so with uh, no other business, we can close this meeting at, can't read that now, uh, 2123. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. And thank you. The people have just gone, haven't they? So thank you for them taking it to the end. Just thank you very much. <laughs>